Nation. You are CUBE alumni. Live from Silicon Valley, it's the CUBE. Covering Google Cloud Next 17. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're live here in the Palo Alto studio for theCUBE, our new 4,500 square foot studio we just moved into a month and a half ago. I'm John Furrier You're here, breaking down two days of live coverage in studio of Google Next 2017. We have reporters and analysts in San Francisco on the ground, getting all the details. We had some call-ins. We're also going to call in at the end of the day to find out what the reaction is to the news, the keynotes, and all the great stuff on day one, and certainly day two tomorrow, here in the studio as well as in San Francisco. My next guest is Tyler Bell, good friend, uh, industry guru, IOT expert, has been doing a lot of work with IOT, but also has a big data background. He's been on theCUBE before. Tyler, great to see you, and thanks for coming in today. Thanks, great to be here. So data has, has been in your wheelhouse for a long time. You're a product guy, and the cloud is the, the, the future hope. It's happening big time. Data at the edge with IOT is certainly part of this network transformation trend. Um, and, and certainly now machine learning and AI is the now the big buzzword, AI kind of a mental model. But machine learning, using the data. You've been at the front end of this for years uh, with data you, uh, at Factual and uh, at Mapbox, your other companies you worked for. Um, now you have data sets. So before it was like a ton of data and now it's data sets. And then you got the IOT edge, a car, smart city, a device. What's your take on the data intersecting with the cloud? What are the key, key paradigms that are cl that are colliding together? Yeah, there's. Uh, I mean, the the reason IoT is so hot right now is really because it's connecting a number of things that are also hot. So together, you get this sort of conflagration of, of <laughs> fires, tech, technology fires. Uh, so on one side, you've got uh, massive data sets, just huge uh, data sets about people, places, and things that allow systems to learn. So on the other end, you've got basically large-scale computation, which isn't only just available, but it's actually accessible and it's affordable. And then on the other end, you've got massive data collection mechanisms. So this is anything from the mobile phone that you'll hold in your pocket to a, a LIDAR, laser-based uh, sensor on a car. So this combination of massive uh, sort of hardware derived data collection mechanisms combined with a, price, a place to process it on the cloud, do so affordably, in addition to all the data, means that you get this wonderful combination of, uh, uh, of, of the advent of AI and machine learning and basically the, the development of smart systems. Uh, and that's really what everybody's excited about. It's kind of intoxicating if you think about it. I mean, from a computer science standpoint, this is the nirvana we've been thinking about for generations. With the compute now available, we have, it's just kind of coming together. What are the key things that are emerging in your mind? Because you've been doing a lot of this big data stuff. When I say big, I mean like large amounts, large scale data. But as it comes in, you know, as they say, the world's, the future's here, but it's evenly distributed. You could also say that same argument with data. Data is everywhere, but it's not evenly distributed. So yeah. what, what are some of the key things that you see happening that are important for people to understand with data in terms of using it, applying it, commercializing it, leveraging it? Yeah, it's, um, what, what you see or what you have seen previously is the idea of data in many people's minds has been a database or, or it's been sort of a CSV file of rows and columns and it's been this sort of fixed entity. And what you're seeing now is that, and that's sort of known as structured data. And, and what you're seeing now is the advent of data analytics that allow people to understand and, and analyze loose collections of data and begin to sort of categorize and, and classify content in ways that have, you know, people haven't been able to, to do so previously. And so whereas you used to have just a database of sort of all the places on the globe or a whole bunch of people, uh, right now you can have information about, uh, uh, say, the, the images that the, the uh, camera sensors on your car sees, and because uh, the systems have been trained about how to identify objects or street signs or certain behaviors and actions, mm -hmm. it means that your systems are getting smarter. And so what's happening here is that data itself is driving this trend where hardware and sensors, even though they're getting cheaper and they're getting increasingly commoditized, they're getting uh, more intelligent. Uh, mm -hmm. And that intelligence is really dr driven by, yeah. by fundamentally it's driven by data. Well, I was having a conversation yesterday I, uh, at Stanford, uh, um, there was a conference going on around bias and, da and data. Algorithms now have bias, gender bias, male bias. But it brings up this notion of programmability. And one of the things that um, 
you know, some of the early thinkers around um, data, including yourself, now, and, and also we extend that out to IoT, is how do you make data available for software programs, for the learning piece? Because that means that data is now an input uh, into the software development process, whether that's you know algorithms on the fly being developed in the future, or data being a part of the software development kit, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, what is that a fantasy? Or is that gettable? Is that in reach? Is it happening? Making data part of that agile process, not yeah. just a call to a database. Exactly, and and what you're, uh, I mean, a lot of the things, um, the most valuable assets now are called basically labeled data sets, where you could say that this this event or this photo or this sound even a, a, has been classified as such, and so it's the bark of a dog or the, the the ring of a gunshot, and those labeled data sets are hugely valuable in actually training systems to to learn. The other thing is, um, if you look at it from say at AV, which is has a lot in common with IoT. But the data set is less about a specific sort of structured or labeled event or entity. And instead, it's doing something like putting, uh, th there's one company where you can put your, your camera on the dashboard of your car and then you drive around. And all this does is just records the images and records which way your car goes. And, and that's actually collecting and learning data. And so that kind of information is being used to teach cars how to drive and how to react in different circumstances. And so on one hand, you've got this highly structured label data. On the other hand, it's almost sort of machine behavioral data where to teach a car how to drive, cars need to understand what that actually yeah. entails. Yeah, one of the things we were talking about Google Next uh, earlier in, in the day, in a couple earlier segments, I was talking about that, I mean this as a criticism to the enterprise, but I was just saying, you know, Google might want to throttle back their messaging or their, their concepts because the enterprise kind of works at a different pace. Google is just this high energy, uh, I won't say academic, but they're working on cutting edge stuff and, and they have things like maps and they're doing things um, that are just really off the charts technically. It's just great technical prowess. So, so there's a disconnect between enterprise stuff um, and what I call pure Google Cloud. The question that's now on the table is now with the advent of IOT, industrial IOT in particular, enterprises now have to be smarter about analog data, meaning like the real world. <laughs> How do you get the data into the cloud from a real world perspective? Do you have any insight on that? I mean, it's something that's hard to kind of get, but you mentioned that cam on the car, you're essentially you know, recording the world. So that's the sky, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's not digitized. You're digitizing an analog signal. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, th I think I'd, I'd have two notes there. Uh, the first is that um, uh, the, the e everything that's sort of going on that's exciting is really at this nexus between the real world that you and I operate in now and sort of how that's captured and digi digitized and, and actually collected online so it can be analyzed and processed and then affected back in the real world. And so when you hear about IoT and cars, of course there are sensors which basically do a, a, a read type analysis of the real world but you also have effectors with which change it and servos which turn your turn your tires or or affect the the acceleration or the braking of a vehicle and so all these interesting things that are happening now and it really kicked off of course with the mobile phone is how the online sort of data centric electric world connect with with the real world um, and all of that's really um, uh, being all that information is being collected is through sort of a, an explosion of sensors because you just have sort of the mobile phone supply chains are making cameras mm -hmm. and barometers and magnetometers. All of these things are now so in increasingly inexpensive that when people talk about sensors, they don't talk about one thousand dollar sensor that's designed to do one thing. Instead, there's thousands of one dollar sensors. So you've been doing a lot of work with IoT. You've been uh, the, almost the past year. You've been out in the IoT world. Um, thoughts on how um, the cloud should be enabled or set up for ingesting data or to be architected properly for IoT related activities, whether yeah. it's edge uh, data store or edge data. I mean, we have little things as boring as backup and recovery are impacted by the cloud. And I can imagine that the IoT world as it coll collides in with IT um, is going to have some reinvention, reconstruction. Thoughts on what the cloud needs to do to be truly IoT 
Yeah, ready. it's it's uh, it, it, there's some very interesting things that are yeah. happening here, and some of them seem to be in conflict with each other. So the the cloud is a critical part of the the IoT sort of uh, entire stack, and it really it really goes from the from the device or the sensor all the way to the cloud. And what you're getting is you are getting providers, including uh, Google and Amazon and SAP, and and there's over 370 last count IoT platform providers, which are basically taking their particular skill set and um, adjusted it and tweaked it and uh, they now say that we ha now have an IOT platform. And in traditional sort of cloud uh, services, this the, the distinct distinguishing features are things like being able to have sort of digital, uh, st record digital state of sensors and devices, sort of shadow states, mm -hmm. um, a fo an increased focus on streaming technology over MapReduce batch technology, which you got in the last 10 years through sort of, um, you know, the, the, the big data movement and the mm -hmm. conversations yeah. that you and I have had previously. So there is that focus on streaming. There is a IoT specific sort of feature stack. But what's happening is that um, because so much data Data is being corrected. Let's let's imagine that you and I are are doing something where we're mi monitoring the environment using cameras, and we have ten thousand cameras out there. And this could be within a vehicle, it could be in a building, or a smart city, or uh, in in a smart building. Um, cameras are the the cloud traditionally accepts data from all these different um, resources, be it mobile phones or terminals, and collects it, analyzes it, and spits it back out in some kind of consumable format. But what's happening now is that IoT is, and, and the availability of these sensors is generating so much data that it's inefficient and very expensive to send it all back to the cloud. And so all of and these- And it's physics too, there's a lot of physics, right? Exactly, you know? and I mean, all of these cameras sending full raster images and videos back to the cloud for analysis, basically the whole idea of real time goes away if you have that much data, you can't analyze it. So instead of just the camera sending a single dumb raster image back, you teach the camera to recognize something. So you could say, I, I, I recognize a vehicle in this picture, or I recognize a stop sign or a street light. And instead of sending that image back to be analyzed on the cloud, the analysis is done on the device, and then that entity is sent back. And so the sensor says, I saw this stop sign at this point at this time in my process. So this gets back to the earlier point you were making about the learning piece and the libraries and these uh, data sets. Is that, is that kind of where that thread connects? And exactly, so to build the intelligence on the device, that intelligence happens on the cloud. <laughs> and so you need to have the training sets uh, and you need to have you know, massive GPUs and huge computational power to, yeah. to instruct. Yeah. And Thanks basically. Intel and NVIDIA, we need more of those, right? <laughs> Indeed, and so uh, th that's what's happening on the cloud and then those learnings are basically consolidated and then put up on the device. And the device doesn't need the GPUs, but the device does need to be smart. Yeah. And, and so if you, you know, in, in IoT, I'm especially look for companies that understand, especially hardware companies, that understand that uh, the, the product as such is no longer just a device, it's no longer just a sensor, it's an integral combination of device, intelligence platform in the cloud, and data. So talk about the, the notion of, um, the recon uh, let's talk about the reconstruction of some of the value creation or value opportunities with, with what you just talked about, because if, if you believe what you just said, which I do believe is right on the money, that this new functionality vis-a-vis -vis the cloud and the smart edge and learning edge and software is going to change the nature of the apps. So if I'm a cloud provider like Google or Amazon, I have to then have the power in the cloud, but it's really the app game that's the software game then that we're talking about here. It's the apps themselves. So yeah, you might have an Atom processor that has two cores versus you know 72 cores in Xeon and the cloud. Okay, that's a device thing. But the software itself at the app level changes. Is that kind of what's happening? Uh, what's your, I mean, where's the real disruption? I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, is it still about the apps? Um, yeah, so I tend not to think about apps much anymore, <laughs> and I guess you, you know, if you talk to some VCs, they won't think about apps much anymore either. It's rather, it, it tends to, and you know, you and I um, still think, uh, and I think so many of us in Silicon Valley still think of, of mobile phones as being sort of the endpoint for both data collection and data uh, effusion. Um, but really, uh, one of the exciting things about IoT now is that it's, it's moving away from the phone. So it's vehicles, it's the sensors in the vehicle, 
vehicles, it's factories and yeah. the sensors in the factories and smart cities. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is you're collecting so much more data, yeah. um, but also you're also being more intelligent about how you collect it. And so it's, it's less about the app and it's much more about the actual sort of intelligence that's baked yeah. into the silicon layer or the yeah. firmware of the device. Yeah, I tried to get you on our Mobile World Congress special last week um, and uh, just we were just booked out, but you, I know you go to Mobile World Congress, you've been there a lot. 5G was certainly a big story there. Uh, they had the new devices, all the new LG phone, the phones are mm -hmm. all the sexy glam, but the 5G and the network transformation becomes more than the device, so you're getting at the point, which is, it's not about the device anymore. It's beyond the device, it's more about the interplay between the back at the network. It is, it's the full stack, but also it's not just from one device. Like the phone is one human, one device, and then that pipeline goes into the cloud usually. The exciting thing about IoT and the general direction that things are moving now, it's what can thousands of sensors tell us? What can what can millions of mobile phones driven over 100 million miles of, uh, yeah. of um, yeah. uh, road surface, what can that tell us about traffic patterns or our cities? So the general trend that you're seeing here is that it's less about two eyeballs and one phone and much more about thousands and yeah. millions of sensors and then how you can develop data-centric products built on that conflagration of all of that data coming in and how quickly you can yeah. build them. We're here with Tyler Bell, IoT expert, but also a data expert, good friend. We both have uh, kids who play lacrosse together who are growing up in front of our eyes, but let's talk about the, uh, them for a second, uh, Tyler, because they're going to grow up in a world where it's going to be completely different. So kind of knowing what we know and as we kind of like tease out the future and connect the dots, um, what are you excited about this, this next generation shift that's happening? I mean, if you could tease out some of the highlights in your mind for the, as our kids grow up, right? Yeah. I mean, you're going to start thinking about, I mean, the societal impact from algorithms that might have gender bias or smart cities that need to start thinking about services for residents that require certain laning for autonomous vehicles mm. or will car go, will transportation is not going to go away. Certainly car buying might shift. They are cloud, they're cloud native, they're digital native. What are, what are you excited about about this future? Yeah, I think it's uh, the the thing that it the thing that's I think so huge that I have difficult difficulty looking away from it is just the impact, the societal impact that autonomous vehicles are going to have. And so really as we, you know, it, not only as our children grow up, but certainly their children, our grandchildren will wonder how in the heck we were allowed to drive, you know, massive metal machines um, and just anywhere. <laughs> with no and software. With, yeah, with, with really just our eyeballs and our hands and no yeah. guidance and no yeah. safety. Yeah. Um, you know, safety is going to be such a critical part of this. But it's not just the vehicle, um, although that's that's, that's what's getting everybody's attention right now. It's really what's going to happen to parking lots in the cities. How how are uh, parking uh, lots and curbsides going to be reclaimed by cities? How will accessibility and safety within cities be affected mm -hmm. by by the ability to, in, at least in principle, just call an autonomous vehicle anytime, have it arrive at your doorstep and yeah. take you where you need to go. What does that look like? It's going to change how cars are bought and sold, how they're mm -hmm. leased. It's going to change the impact of brands, the significance of, uh, is, you know, are these things going to be commoditized? But ultimately, I think in terms of societal impact, we've re we, have, we, we have for generations grown up in an automotive world, and we will, our grandchildren will grow up in an automotive world, but it will be so changed because it will impact yeah. entirely what our cities yeah. and our urban spaces look like. The good like. news is when they take our driver's license away when we're 90, we'll at least be able to still get into a car. There's places we can go. <laughs> we can still drive. Exactly, exactly. The timing is right. We may not have immortality, but we will be able to get from one place to another in our senility. We might be a, buy, a demographic to buy a self-driving car. Hey, you're over 90, you should buy a self-driving car. Well, it'll be, it'll be more like a consortium. Like you, I, and maybe 30 other people. We, we have access to a yeah, car. Whole new, whole new um, um, a man cave definition of a, to bring to the automotive. Tyler, thanks for sharing uh, the insight. Really appreciate the color commentary on the cloud, the impact of data, appreciate it. We're here for the two days of coverage of Google Next here inside theCUBE. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. More coverage coming up after this short break. I'm George.